I'd like to thank the Eisenhower Foundation for sponsoring this event for us today. And we are really excited to welcome back Andrew Oak. Several of us had the opportunity to work with Andy in 2013 as he was traveling the country working on filming C-SPAN's First Lady series. Marilyn Holt, sitting at the table over here, was one of the online presences for the Mamie episode. During that time, I was still in St. Louis at the Ulysses S. Grant National Historic Site, and I think Andy still connects me kind of with Julia Grant. So it's nice to move over to 20th century First Lady. During the, uh, Andy spoke during the Mother's Day tea here in 2014 before his first volume of Unusual for Their Time was even released. Now his second volume is out and it includes Mamie Eisenhower. Both volumes are available in our gift shop and Andy will be available to sign your copy after the program. If you haven't purchased it yet, he'll go over to the visitor center there where you can make the purchase and he will sign it for you. Andy has a lot of great stories from his travels across the country getting to know our first ladies. So please help me welcome America's first ladies man, Andrew Oak. Thank you. Thank you and hello, Abilene. Happy Mother's Day to all those it applies. To those who it does not apply, thank you for joining us today as well. This for me, um, is a sort of homecoming with the series. It is in these back hallways, as I walked with William and Samantha, that the first ladies' man was actually born. The idea had been percolating in, in season one, the 1700s and 1800s, where I did work with Pam down in St. Louis at the, uh, at the White Haven Plantation, the Grant um, uh, National Historic Site. I had ideas, I had visions, but they didn't come clear until I literally walked in here and around the back and through the windows and saw an easel. And on the easel was a promotion for an upcoming speaker. And I said to Samantha, let's say I put something like that together. Is my story, are my adventures the type of thing that you would invite here to share with others? And she said, absolutely, it's 100%. So in volume two, and in parts of volume one, and here today, and when I was here in 2014, I have no trouble reiterating how special Abilene is and how nice it was to pull off onto KS15 and past the Sonic and the Pizza Hut and all of the places that I knew so well from my travels to join my friends and people who I consider family here in Abilene. So sincerely, thank you for having me back. Now consider this. Abilene, Kansas. Abilene, Kansas would not be Abilene, Kansas. In fact, the United States of America would not be the United States of America if George Washington had not married Martha Dandridge Custis. America would not be a country if George Washington married any other woman. I know everyone in the room is familiar with the phrase, behind every great man is an even greater woman. It has never been more true than the beginning of our country. And here's why. George Washington was not Martha's first husband. Does this surprise anyone? Did anyone not know this? I was not blatantly aware of this, even coming from Washington, D.C. My fifth grade trip was to Colonial Williamsburg, where you do learn a considerable amount about these early women and George Washington and Martha Custis. But it's not on the front of our brain. It is not what we think of when we think of Martha Washington. And here's how the whole timeline goes and why it's so important. Martha Dandridge was a young woman in Colonial Williamsburg and wanted to marry Daniel Park Custis. Daniel Park Custis went to his father and said, I'm going to marry Martha Dandridge. His father said, no, you are not. 
he said, but dad, I love her. And he said, I'm sure you do, but she's not of the same social standing. The wedding will not take place. It's the end of the subject. He said, meet her, talk to her. You will love her as I do, and, and you will want me to marry her. You'll want this marriage to go through. Said, Fine. He was intending to say no, but he changed his mind. Martha Dandridge was unusual for her time. Homeschooled, maybe not the poorest girl in town, but certainly not the most wealthy girl in town. The wedding goes through. Martha Dandridge Custis. Then Custis dies. Leaves her a widow at the age of 26 with four children, two of whom live to young adulthood, but not past that. The children we see in paintings, portraits, etchings of the Washingtons are Martha's grandchildren from her first marriage. But more importantly, Custis left her uber wealthy. She was in charge of over 8,000 productive tobacco acres, about a quarter of the real estate in Williamsburg, and in cash on hand in the house, she had three to four times the Virginia state governor's salary in silver. And if you look back at pictures that have been recreated digitally, constructing com with computer programs and stuff, you will see Martha Dandridge Custis was hot. I'm here to tell you, she was a good-looking lady. She's young, she's attractive, she's wealthy, and here's the thing to consider. Martha Dandridge Custis was essentially our first colonial female CEO. Right? Some people thinking about that, wheels are turning. Being a housewife, being a mother, especially today when we celebrate that, there's almost no other important job. Back then, it was even more. You were running the family business, the corporation. You're how the family clothed themselves, how you grew the cotton to make the clothes that would clothe yourself, the animals that would feed you, the crops that would you feed you. At 26 years old, Martha Dandridge Custis is doing this when she meets George Washington. If I'm George Washington, heck yeah, I'm marrying this woman. <laughs> She's the most eligible widow in the colonies. Now, let's say things went differently. Let's play Back to the Future. Everyone know that movie, right? You go back and you mix around the puzzle pieces and you change things. Some people call it the butterfly effect. Let's say George marries Mary Smith down the street. Let's say Mary Smith's got some cash and some, some privilege too, some social standing. But she can't run that. She doesn't have the wherewithal, the aptitude, the fortitude to run that business, that corporation like Martha Dandridge Custis did. George Washington can't get on his horse and run up and down the East Coast fighting the Redcoats. If he marries anyone other than Martha Dandridge Custis, we're not America. No America, World War I looks a little bit different. World War II looks a little bit different. Things near and dear to my heart, Harley-Davidson motorcycles, McDonald's, Coca-Cola, Apple computers. Folks, this stuff does not happen if George Washington doesn't marry Martha Dandridge Custis. These women are such an equal partner a necessary partner in the creation, formation, success, and continuation of the United States, it is beyond belief. And it happens at every stage of the game. My name is Andrew Oak. I'm called the First Lady's Man. Because for C-SPAN, I traveled to nearly every home, library, church, train station, general store, plantation farm, school, cemetery, birthplace, every first lady, Martha Washington, through now Melania Trump. I found these women to be unusual for their time. Not just unusual for other women, but men, children, 
and everyone. Without these women, we would not be America. Without America, the modern world looks very, very different. The series was called Influence and Image. Influence. That's a tough one for a television producer to put on camera. How do you, how do, you do that? What is influence? How do you visually portray that? Well, trip number two was to Quincy, Massachusetts, where I got to know Abigail and our first foreign-born first lady, Catherine, Louisa Catherine Adams. The uh, Massachusetts Historical Society has 70,000 pages of Adams family correspondence. And I got to look through it. I had white gloves on. I was behind a gated, locked fence, and there was a man much larger than me, which is not difficult to do, who looked very official, making sure that everything was going the way it was and should have been, which I'm happy about. But I got to hold letters, and I got to read influence, and I got to learn things about these first ladies, the Adamses, that I was not taught in school. When George Washington decided not to run for president for a third term, he announced it. He told his vice president, John Adams, and John Adams did what he always did. He wrote home to ask his wife what he should do. <laughs> the, the first vice president of the United States, second president of the United States in the 1790s, early 1800s, writes home to say, honey, Washington's not running. What, what should I do? And I held the letter of her response. And she said, if you're asking me if you should run for president, she had flowery language of the day. It was something to the effect of, God will guide your hand and your heart. You will figure that out on your own. But if you are asking whether you should run for another term as vice president, on that, I will answer. And she answered very clearly. She said, I will serve under no man other than George Washington. Now let's think about that. Put that into modern terms. She basically said, come home president or just come home. <laughs> and he came home president. There's a very famous phrase that is associated with uh, Abigail Adams. Many of you in, in the room probably know it. Remember the ladies. We hear it often. Remember the ladies. That's a bold statement for that time. That's a bold statement for this time. That's a bold statement. What a lot of people don't know are the words that surround that in the letter. I know the words that surround it because I've held the letter. Remember the ladies, for when you have them in your favor, the men will be on your side. There's already people laughing because you get it. I didn't get it at first. I might not even have gotten it in volume one. I got it by volume two. I get it now. Remember the ladies, for when you have them in your favor, the men will be on your side. In your homes, for the most part, you're sitting in your living rooms, as I do in Shadyside, Maryland, in front of my big TV that's smarter than me. Who's holding the remote? You're right. I'm holding the remote. I'm the man. I bought that TV. I hold that remote. I hold that power. You think I'm picking the shows? <laughs> Abigail Adams knew in the late 1700s, before electricity, and hundreds of years before women would have the right to vote, that men were holding the remotes and women were picking the shows. <laughs> Pitbulls and paroles isn't my pick, but I watch it. 
let's say Colonial Andy comes home. Colonial Heather, my significant other, is waiting on the couch. She says, the election's tomorrow. Who are you voting for? Well, I say, well, I was thinking about voting for John Adams. She goes, well, that's dumb. <laughs> Colonial Andy stops to think, is that dumb? Am I dumb? Flip this coin. Colonial Andy comes home and says, the election is tomorrow and I'm voting for John Adams. And Colonial Heather says, you're a smart man. I say, yes, I am. I'm a smart man because my wife said so. I'm a smart man. Remember the ladies, the men will be in your favor. Abigail Adams knew it in the late 1700s. Her writings, her work with gender, religion, civil rights, are progressive thinking for today. Influence and image. Image is an easy one, right? We're looking at images. What is the number one thing you think of when you think of first ladies? A, an article, a physical thing you can touch, use, whatever. Just yell it out. Yeah, there it is, number one answer. Number one answer. If we're playing Family Feud, gowns is the number one answer. 95% of the people in 95% of the rooms, in 95% of the speeches, the first thing out of someone's mouth, dresses. Do you know where the first inaugural dress came from? I did not. Most people don't. Growing up outside of Washington, D.C., the Smithsonian was my playground, was every field trip, was every uh, relatives visit, we would go down there. When I went for the series, I went through the special entrance, past the coded doors, the Indiana Jones special cool rooms. And my host there, Lisa Kathleen Grady, said, well, you've seen the dresses outside. We should probably show you the first. Yes, please. Now I'm thinking, Martha Washington, Abigail Adams, one of the Roosevelts, who know, you know? Helen Taft. Helen Taft donated the first inaugural gown. Helen Taft, I'm just gonna go out on a limb here and say, because we're not in Ohio, and I did make this mistake in Ohio, but I will say that most of you in the room, if you were naming five, 10, 15, maybe 20 first ladies, Helen Taft wouldn't be one of them. Is that a fair assumption? Well, like I say, I'm not in Ohio, because I did say that when I was speaking at the Hayes Presidential Library Museum, and a very nice lady in the back of the room went, you're in Ohio. And I said, okay, fair point. And she's from Cincinnati. I knew that. I knew Helen Taft was from Cincinnati. Just forgot what room I was speaking in. But most people would not think of Helen Taft. Two socialite women in Washington, D.C. were putting together the first first ladies exhibit, and Helen Taft was the sitting first lady. They went to her and said, Mrs. Taft, we can't have a first ladies exhibit without something from the sitting first lady. Anything, your pick, dealer's choice. She could have picked anything. It could have been shoes. It could have been a handbook, hand, uh, handbag, purse. It could have been jewelry. But ladies in the room, you will know, similar to homecoming or the prom or your wedding, if they've seen you in at once, the dress is pretty much dead to you, right? So she wore the inaugural gown, and everyone saw her in it. And she said, here, take this. I'm done with this. Thus starting the tradition, and now, retroactively and moving forward, we have a dress to represent, whether inaugural gown or not, because not everyone has an inauguration, or a celebration, or a gown, or a dance, or ball, certainly before they even had them. We have a dress to represent every first lady because of Helen Taft. 
How many people in the room have been to D.C.? Okay, excellent. Did you see the cherry blossom trees when you were there, by any chance? Yeah, wonderful. People come from around the world. I've been in bands that have played the Cherry Blossom Festival. Again, grew up outside of Washington, D.C. When you were there and saw the cherry blossoms, did you think to thank Helen Taft for them? Because you should have. She planted the first one. Helen Taft wanted nothing more than to marry a president. And here's why. How many of you in the room, over the years of your youth and childhood, were sent away to camp or a relative's house on spring break, summer break, because your parents needed a break? <laughs> I was sent away a lot. Well, so was young Nellie Heron, Helen Heron. Except when she was sent to her family friend's house, she was sent to her father's former law partner. Her father's former law partner was President Rutherford B. Hayes. So that's where Nellie got to spend her spring break, walking up and down the halls of the White House saying, I could get used to this. I want to come back here someday. So when her husband wanted to become nothing more than a Supreme Court justice, uh, which he had a deal, he had a deal with McKinley, President McKinley, said, go to the Philippines. Fix that mess in the Philippines for me. You come back, and you got a seat on the, on, the, on the Supreme Court. We all know what happened to McKinley. The deal died with him. When he came back and Theodore Roosevelt decided not to run, and then became Theodore Roosevelt and decided to run again and make his own party and do things his own way, which is it, re respectable in its own right, Helen Taft was the first one to say, my husband's ready, look what he did with the Philippines. And that's where she saw all these beautiful riverside parks and things. So when it came, came time to clean up DC, we know DC is built on a swamp, right? Uh, the, the tidal basin around where the cherry blossoms are all planted was a swamp with a, with, a, with a dirt roadway. I think motor cars went by at a, at a roaring 15 miles per hour, throwing mud everywhere. But it was time to clean it up. Helen Taft arranged to have cherry blossoms sent over from Japan and planted, and thus there they are. And some of the original ones are still there. I've walked around that tidal basin, I don't even know how many times. It could be 10,000 times in my life. And I never thought, well, Helen Taft did this. Helen Taft also, when her husband did win the presidency, and as the tradition was, the outgoing president would ride in the carriage from the Capitol to the White House as sort of a, you know, the, the peaceful transfer of power that we celebrate here in the United States so often. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, that, was the, that was the tradition, that the outgoing president would say, hey, nice job, buddy. You know, well, because Theodore Roosevelt decided to be Theodore Roosevelt and say, no, I do want to be president, changed my mind and I'm running, and then didn't win, he goes, there's no way I'm getting in that carriage with that guy. He took my job and my house. So there's an empty seat. Who do you think the first first lady to ride in the carriage with her husband was? Helen Taft. She loved DC so much, she's also the first first lady of two, only two, to be buried in Arlington National Cemetery. Can anyone name the other? Jackie Kennedy, very good. From here on out, if you don't know the answer, say Kennedy or Roosevelt, and the odds will be in your favor. <laughs> That's Cliff Notes. That's special because it's Mother's Day. I don't tell every audience that. But yes, Helen Taft is the first of two first ladies to be buried in Arlington National Cemetery, where she stays with her husband, who did become a Supreme Court Justice after the presidency, the only president to do so. So I think everyone got what they wanted there. Today is Mother's Day. Tomorrow's Mother's Day. Tomorrow's Mother's Day. But we're celebrating Mother's Day today. So I want to talk about some mothers. And I do. These are the two things that I want to cover today. Mothers and Mamie. Mamie's also a mother. But I know, I know we're not in Ohio. I'll leave it at that. So we're going to talk about Mamie in a minute. But more of the footprint that these women, who we would not name, 5, 10, 15, 20, put on our modern world that we don't know or give that proper recognition to. Most people in the room, myself included, when you say Roosevelt, you think Eleanor. Eleanor. Exactly. 
There's another Roosevelt. There's another highly influential and significant Roosevelt. We're going back in time one administration, but Edith Roosevelt. When Edith Roosevelt got to the White House, it was like the circus had come to DC. Six kids, seven if you include Theodore, which I do, <laughs> and a cavalcade of animals and activity that the country needed and wanted. In Oyster Bay at Sagamore Hill, the Roosevelt National Historic Site, they have a large rendition of a New Yorker time, uh, uh, New Yorker magazine cover. Santa Claus coming down the chimney of the White House with a sack full of presents, and it says, presents, sack full of presents, sack full of presents. And it says, there's life in the old house yet. The McKinley administration was interesting and a whole nother study and woman and circumstances of their own, but it was not an active White House. We'll leave it at that for, for now. The Roosevelt White House was an active White House. So active that before President Theodore Roosevelt took an audience with, I believe, the Japanese Prime Minister, young Ethel came running into his office, the Oval Office, and said, Dad, Dad, the boys are going to feed the guinea pig to the hyena. And the funny thing is that there was a hyena in the White House to feed the guinea pig too. So Roosevelt took that guinea pig and said, there, there, Ethel, stuck it in his pocket, and the guinea pig slept in Roosevelt's pocket throughout the whole meeting with the Japanese Prime Minister, to which he returned the... We know this because Ethel Roosevelt preserved a lot of that family history. The Roosevelts all wore little red leather baby booties, and they've got fine examples of those there. And books. How many people had Pat the Bunny when they were a kid? Roosevelt's had it in French. Fancy, fancy. But Ethel helped preserve that. These family members helped preserve these things, and that was such a large family. But the Roosevelts had the same issue that we're dealing with today with public and access to the children. They work for us, presidents, and thus we think their families belong to us because we pay their salaries, we elect them, put them in the people's house. Things over the years, especially coming off of an administration where there was an assassination, security was an issue. People wanted access to this large active family, especially after the McKinley years of not having children in the White House. So what Edith did was very smart. She took all the kids, got them dressed up in their Sunday best, and hired one of the top photographers. And they have all these photographs. They said, go outside with your favorite pet, stand in front of your favorite tree, climb your tree, what have you, and we'll take pictures. And she took pictures after pictures after pictures. There's albums and albums and albums. Now. You can Google this stuff. It was in all of the, the top magazines of the day. But she would release them periodically. So the public thought they were getting access to these children, but she was still keeping them safe. She was controlling it. It's kind of like Facebook or Instagram or social media of the day. She was releasing these pictures when she wanted to, to give the public what they wanted. She was protecting her children. This role of first lady is a difficult role because as most of the folks in the room today know, being a mom is hard. Being a mom and being a first lady is even more difficult. The public eye is tough. And I don't think anyone understands that better than the Eisenhowers. There's two things that I learned here. Well, I learned way more than two things. Two very significant things that all have to do with, in my opinion, the most remarkable two collections that you have here with regards to Mamie. One deals with image, and the other deals with influence. How about that? Image. The Mamie Bangs. I was shown here clip-on Mamie Bangs that women could buy in drugstores. 
Now today, whenever I make a, a, a social media post, a historical on this day that relates to Mamie, and I put up a picture of Mamie, everyone always gets on her hair and this, that, and the other and everything. It's an unusual look, so much so that she had her stylist create a how-to booklet that is still on display here, it's still on display here, to show people at this famous salon how to do this to duplicate this, not only for Mamie, but for walking in and say, hey, I'll have the Mamie, please. And there you get it. Or you'd buy your clip-ons at the drugstore. This was a look that was created out of two people, very public people, that had a tragedy and had to deal with that tragedy in the public eye, as many of these women do. They lost their son, Icky, at the age of three, and it almost tore apart their marriage. This was a spice up things. This was a make a change. This is a new beginning. And it turns into a trademark look that is then duplicated for women around the world, and they don't even know why. Not only do we change the way we eat, change the way we exercise, we change the way we look because of these women. That's the influence they have. Mamie Pink. I, 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 will, I will go to the mat on this and say that Dwight D. Eisenhower is the only president to be photographed sleeping in pink satin sheets. And he did it like a boss, did he not? <laughs> Even though we know who the boss was, right? Mamie. Mamie and Dwight are the opposite of George and Martha. No, switch that. I'm trying to figure it out in my head. They're the, they're the mirror of she... Dwight married up is what I'm clumsily trying to get at here. So in the same way that George Washington married up, but Mamie took a step back from privilege to give this life on the road, entertaining what she loved to do. Which brings me to the first part of Mamie in my mind, which is image, as we talked about her haircut. There was no more extensive collection of clothes in my entire travels, pinballing for a year and two months across the country to all of these locations, no one had more clothes than Mamie. And she wore them well. She had shoes, she had hats, she had sleeveless dresses because apparently Ike liked her arms. Said she had beautiful arms. She was time appropriate, she was age appropriate, she was used to the public eye, but this is where Mamie became real to me. At nearly every site that I traveled to, I would talk on the phone first, get a little pre-interview, we call it in the business, about what was in store for me, because I'd never been to Abilene before. And William kept telling me, we've got these bed coats, We've got endless, endless bed coats. And I'd heard things, I'm like, okay, well, I mean, it's not like he's speaking Russian, I get it, bed coat, but what's, okay, he's got bed coats. This dude's freaking out over these bed coats. What are they? And, 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 and earlier, going way back to my first trip to Virginia, Scott Harris at the Frederick uh, Monroe Library was freaking out over some hair earrings. And I'm like, dude, all right, we'll see the hair earrings. What and then I get there and it's earrings made out of hair. Well, in the, it's different times, folks. We can't, in the, in, the, in, the, in the 1700s, it was a term of endearment. You would have had quite a different reaction if someone had given you hair earrings in the 1700s. But I digress. We're, we're, we're in the modern times. Volume two, focus, focus. So when I get here and I look at these bed coats, I get it. Mamie had heart issues. She was told by her doctor, you can't work five days a week. Your heart can't take it. Mamie wasn't going to take a day off. It's just the kind of lady she was. So she said, we'll start each day a little bit later. But I'm going to need to have my staff meetings in my bedroom if I'm not going to get out of bed till 11 o'clock or noon each day to rest my heart. But people will come to me. 
and I need to look presentable. So she's got these fantastic bed coats with boas and sequins and pinks and it's they're glorious. But that's not what made her human to me. What made her human was the work she did and the evidence we have of that work, what she did. Not just her daily schedule and things that you would imagine from a first lady, but there are catalogs. They're here in the library, just like I did and probably everyone else in this room did around Christmas time. Those catalogs came and you circled the G.I. Joe or the Barbie Dream Home or whatever it was you wanted that Christmas. Well, that's what her grandchildren did. Four, I believe. Four grandchildren? Four grandchildren that she was very, very close with. And she was a good grandma. Because just because she's first lady doesn't mean she's not wife, mother, grandmother, human being. And there's little notes. Susie wants a slinky. Mikey wants a puppy. All the stuff and it's circled and things. I did that to create my letter to Santa. And they become real. They step out of the pages of history books, off of the oil paintings, and they become real people. Influence. When Dwight D. Eisenhower was elected president for the first time, there had never been that many women that voted and clearly made the right choice, in my opinion, in an election and voted for Eisenhower. I like Mamie. Right here. And during the elections, I would have been the majority wearing this pin. I would have been the electorate majority. Over the course of our history, women have entered into politics, the political arena. First ladies have been marketed as this other, but never the way Mamie did. And she went in with gusto, like everything else that she did. There are I like Ike, I like Mamie stockings that go with your I like Ike Mamie dress, which go with your I like Mamie gloves that you hold your comb when you lift off your I like Mamie hat. I mean, it's craziness. And here in Abilene, at this facility, within walking distance, there are drawers and drawers and pages and boxes of this stuff and pictures of Ike with women all dressed in I like dresses. I like Ike dresses. I like, if someone had like, if I was pictured with like 20 women and they all had I like the first ladies man dresses, I'd be, it'd be up in every room in my house. That'd be fantastic. That would be absolutely fantastic. Mamie it helped elect her husband in a way that no other first lady had done. Not all first ladies like politics. Some first ladies love living in the White House. Some first ladies never moved into the White House. And think about the way we think of this stuff in modern times. It's interesting. Almost as interesting as how influential women have been over the years is how differently we treat each first lady in the same circumstances. What's good for one is not good for another. What's bad for one is not bad for another. I'm often asked, and we'll do some question and answer here in a minute, but I'll save you one of the questions. Who's your favorite first lady, Andy? It's like picking a favorite pet. It's like picking a favorite kid. You can't do it. You can't do it. But I will tell you who I think, in my extensive travel and research, is the most influential first lady, past, present, or future. Anyone want to take a stab? All right, fair enough. You guys got me. <laughs> Sadly, no. She's a close second. I'll give you that. How about? But who is the most influential first lady, past, present, or future? 
See, Eleanor Roosevelt, there's my, there's my favorite right now because she was listening. I said, if you don't know, say Roosevelt or Kennedy, and she was listening. She said Roosevelt. Unfortunately, that's the stumper. It's not, it's neither of them. So I kind of fooled you on that one. So I'm sorry, it's like, you know, this should be an April Fool's speech, not a Mother's Day speech. But, but you were paying attention and I appreciate that from you. Betty Ford. Now people, some people are saying no kidding, some people are nodding, some people are puzzled. It took me writing volume two doing a little bit outside of my research, my personal research and travels, to discover a fact about Betty Ford. Betty Ford has indirectly or directly affected every human being on planet Earth. Because there is no human being that I have met and I get around. No human being that I've met that has escaped cancer and or addiction. That human being doesn't exist. We can look back to some of the Adams's children and one of their daughters got a mastectomy in the 1800s. I can't even imagine. There would not be cancer walks, 5Ks, Rehab centers, open public discussions, AA, NA, any of these help groups and support groups and the study and research that we put into it, had someone not been first to bring it out of the back rooms and talk about it? Betty Ford. And here's the crazy thing about that. Betty Ford, more than any other first lady, should not have been first lady. Not because she didn't want it, which she didn't, but because her husband never should have been president. In the sense that he was appointed when Nixon retired. <laughs> but, oh yeah, I didn't even think of that, Michael. That's a good one. <laughs> I feel like Rich Little up here. Well, there's one. There's, that'll date me. Um, but more importantly than not being president, and this is the part I learned, he shouldn't have been vice president. Agnew retired, and he was appointed vice president. So this first lady, given the platform of the office of first lady, changes the world for every human being when she shouldn't even have been in the office that led to the office that he shouldn't have had. <laughs> then I went to Flint, Michigan. Grand Rapids, I'm sorry. Grand Rapids is where the museum is. The Fords are a little weird. They got the museum in one place and the library in the other, and, they, and that's fine, that's wonderful. Betty became real. Betty Bloomer was a dancer, a music fan. We all know the picture of her up on the table in the White House doing that dance before she moved out. But what they showed me in Grand Rapids was something that I could relate to, just like the catalog here in Abilene. She kept her records in a leather-bound album, 78s. My Uncle Max had a Wurlitzer. 78 jukebox in his house. Christmas, Thanksgiving, man. We just plunk our money in there and just play 78s all day. Benny Goodman. All the 78s that Betty Ford would have danced to when she was away at dance school and living in group houses in New York with performers. But when you look through this, and I can, I can still smell and feel the brown. It's almost like a grocery sack brown that that envelope. People are nodding. They know this. They know this. And it has like that. It's just a warm home-cooked kind of neat nostalgic smell to it where she kept her records and on each of the sleeves this is where I didn't know I had so much in common with Betty Ford but but she wrote notes about the songs and the song titles and they're in careful handwriting I can't tell you by the time I was allowed to touch my parents stereo 
and I had money from mowing the lawn, and I would go out and get my Maxell blank tapes at Peaches Records, and I would carefully write in the hand font of every single logo of every band and carefully write all my song titles on all my mixtapes that I kept in my little lunchbox that I traveled around in. That's Betty Ford. That's what she's doing. She even had notes to her roommates like I did in college and said, can you please put the right record back in the right sleeve? <laughs> Betty Ford's human. One of the most human in, in, in all of... First Lady History, because she also came out and said publicly multiple times on 60 Minutes things that did not help her, president, her husband's presidential career. And after they retired, after they left the White House, President Ford said, most of the time I, I more agreed with her than not, but even if I didn't, wouldn't have mattered. She would have said it. She said, if they don't like me, they can throw me out. On 60 Minutes in the 70s. These are the most powerful and influential, unpaid and unelected women in the world. Just by nature of who they marry, who then happens to run for president, who then happens to win the presidency, and then move into the White House. We expect so much. We criticize their every move. We celebrate their victories. But it's a relatively thankless job to be the mother of the country, and sometimes the mother of the world. They've been part of the equation and equal partners from the very beginning. Moving forward with women empowerment, women leadership, roles in modern society, we're not letting anyone new in the room. Women have been there the whole time. We just need to turn around and say, what do you got? Because when we move forward together, not as men or women, but as human beings trying to take a page from the First Lady's playbook to just do things because it's the right thing to do. We're not getting paid for it. We're not expected to do it. We're doing it because it's cool. It's the right thing to do. It's the way to move forward. It's the way to make a better world for everybody. Simply by recognizing an equal partner that's always been in the room with us since the beginning. That's America, that's us, these are our first ladies. I'm your first ladies man. Thank you for your attention, happy Mother's Day, and I'd love to take your questions. I said I would talk a little bit about Barbara Bush. You were listening too, weren't you? Um, I had the good fortune of looking through Barbara Bush's photo albums, scrapbooks. Barbara Bush was a scrapbooker. She is responsible as the matriarch, the Mamie. She's the Mamie in that relationship, another military family, another family well-traveled in public service. But not only of a president, but the mother of a president. Think of the grief you get being the wife of a president then the mother of another president, and the mother of a governor, and the mother of another presidential candidate. When C-SPAN and I did the series together, she was interviewed. And she said in that interview very famously, I would think you could find someone with a name other than Bush or Clinton to run for president. <laughs> Barbara Bush didn't mix words. From what I understand, Mamie didn't mix words. They're very, very, very similar. She also had a self-deprecation to her, self-deprecating humor. She said she wore pearls because she didn't like the way her neck looked. She was interviewed on 60 Minutes, I believe, and someone said, you've been, you've been called unattractive. And she said, oh, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm very attractive. I just don't dress very well.
This woman gave selflessly for her entire life to the world. Literacy is something like water quality. If it's better, everyone benefits. More people read, more people work, more people are productive, more people whatever. Her literacy campaign that she worked on right up to the very end, even I mean, combined with her work with children, to, to, I know people in Maine, very, very close to, to the bushes, that she would go on her birthday, in, in her 80s and I think even into her 90s, to her medical facility in Portland, get down on the floor with children recovering from or suffering from terminal diseases and medical problems and read to them on her birthday. I know for a fact that there was a little boy who came to the end of his journey, but one of his last requests was to thank Mrs. Bush. And she made a video chat happen because she was in Texas. This was a good woman. But she also had that sense of humor, and if you look through her photo albums, this is how intimately I got to know these women. There's the bushes around the Thanksgiving table, wearing ugly Christmas sweaters, teaching their kids how to read, holding balloons at birthdays, fishing, camping. One of the photo albums during what she described as one of her most favorite times in life was in China. The whole photo album, the whole scrapbook is all China. Now, I mentioned the pearls, and we all have an image of Barbara Bush in our, in our minds, and it's probably that beautiful, white, sparkly dress with the pearls and the white hair, and I'm not sure if it's inauguration or which celebration. She's looking up and smiling and red lipstick and the big pearl. That was my image until I flipped to the page of Barbara Bush in some houndstooth print pants a sweatshirt and turtleneck and sneakers doing Tai Chi <laughs> in, ball, in, in, in Beijing. She let loose over there, man. She didn't have any kids. She didn't have any responsibility. All they were over there to do, I think it was the Ford administration that sent them over there to continue the Nixon work to just get to know the Chinese. That's a good gig. You're just paid to be a tourist in China. They rode bicycles through Tiananmen Square. They were on the Great Wall. They were at tea parties. They, they did exactly what they were supposed to do, say, hey, we're all just humans. But man, she just, whoosh, whoosh, she took full advantage. And that's, that's not any, see, now this is great, because now that will be your Barbara Bush. That will be your Barbara Bush. Tai Chi Barbara Bush, Karate Barbara Bush, Kung Fu Barbara Bush now <laughs> is what she is. But she taught the world to read, and she was a wonderful lady. And, and thank you for bringing that up, because I was honored to be a part of the news coverage that, that did talk about her. I was also fortunate enough to do the same for, for Nancy Reagan. And those were two very long-lived, productive lives that, that those women were, were at, at peace and, 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 and ready to rest. I can, I can say that through, with, with much assurance. So, any other questions? Yes? Impressive? Oh, the, the present, the present first lady. Is, Mel, is Melania Trump? Yes. You want to know my thoughts? Okay. I'm just teasing you. Um, here's something remarkable. This is, this is probably the most remarkable thing I've come up with about Melania Trump. The hurricanes, recent hurricanes in Texas, right? She walks out in pink high heels, right? Press goes nuts. She's out of touch. That guy didn't do his homework, the Wall Street Journal guy that tweeted that. Had I wrote that article or seen that scene or been consulted about the scene, I might have said something like this. In the role that most people thought she didn't want or currently doesn't embrace, Melania Trump goes where former first ladies with higher popularity ratings did not. Hurricane Katrina, Hurricane Sandy, Hurricane Rita, Michelle Obama, 
approval rating in the 60s. Laura Bush, approval rating in the 60s. They didn't go. And it was okay. There's no First Ladies 101 in college, folks. They don't teach it to you in home ec, if home ec is even a thing anymore. Melania Trump went to a hurricane zone with her husband in support of his going to do what he was doing when other first ladies did not. When Melania Trump said, I'm not moving to DC yet, everyone called her a liar. A liar. They said, no, she's not. She doesn't want this role. She's not coming to DC. She said, I just want, my, I just want to let my son finish the school year and then I'll, and then I'll, I'll be right down. The people that criticized her didn't line up to congratulate her for doing something that is all too infrequent in politics these days, doing what you say you're going to do. I wrote very early in the campaign that Melania Trump could be the next Jacqueline Kennedy. And people went bananas. Got very angry with me. You don't mess with Jackie. She speaks five different languages, wildly popular on the international stage, and she loves children. She is clearly passionate about children. People say, well, she just now gave her initiative, but now they're criticizing the initiative. It's more and more. Michelle Obama and Melania Trump have the distinction and the misfortune, or unfortune, I call it, of being the first two social media first ladies. Ladies and gentlemen, I am proof positive that anyone can write a book and anyone can have a website and an opinion. <laughs> Fortunately, I have good people like William and Samantha to keep me in check and teach me actual facts that I put in my books, in my speeches, but a lot of people, sadly the majority, can put anything out in social media and it goes unchecked and believed as fact. People can watch the news and think they're getting facts. Melania Trump doesn't like bullying and she likes kids. When Melania Trump is criticized, she does something that some folks think her husband should do more of, which is nothing. She doesn't respond to her critics. She's ignoring the bullies. She's leading by example. She keeps her head down and she moves forward. Now, you know, did I ride my unicorn here today through the cotton candy clouds throwing Skittles all over the place? No, I, 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 I live in a real world. I'm, I, I bet Melania was not the first person saying, go get them, honey, I want to be first lady. I don't think so. But I think like many first ladies, she's adapting. She's making the best of her situation, and she wants a better world for children. And I think that if we judged her the way we judged other first ladies who have been in similar situations, I think she would be able to move forward and do more positive for the role that she finds herself in. So I think that she is a wonderful example of what's good for one is not good for another. I do think that the more we see of her, like most first ladies, the more we like her and her poll numbers are going up. And that's part of a first lady's job is to be that friendly face in the White House because she's not elected and she's not paid and if she stays out of policy and I write this in my book and I'll say it openly I'm a, I'm a fan of all the first ladies obviously but what Hillary Clinton did to break every glass ceiling except that last one of president created the barrier that kept her from breaking that that glass ceiling. politics is ugly 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 business I grew up in D.C. I'm telling you, not anything you don't know, but it's worse than you think and always has been. And Hillary, no one, no one will ever be the first woman presidential candidate of a major party. 
No first lady will ever be the first first lady to become a U.S. senator. The first first lady to become a secretary of state. Massive, massive accomplishments for any human being, let alone a woman. But the enemies that she created in that policy role that she took on kept her from her greatest goal. It's, it's a gamble. She, she gambled and she won a lot and then, and then she lost the big one at the, at the end. But there's, I think I answered your question, sort of. <laughs> yes, sir. Which first lady was much more popular than her husband? Um, Jackie Kennedy's a good, <laughs> we're still playing the Kennedy Roosevelt game. I'm on to you guys. Um, that's, a good, that's a good one. I mean, Jack, uh, here's, here's the way I will answer that, as I don't have all the numbers of which was the most. If I had more time than we have now to think about it. But I will say, there are a number of first ladies, two that pop into mind, of who were wildly more popular than their husbands and made their husbands better presidents and more accepted. Dolly Madison and Grace Coolidge. Silent Cal was so tight with a penny, he would spend nothing on anything except his wife's wardrobe. Grace Coolidge was probably the second best dressed first lady, as Mamie's the first. Mamie definitely had more clothes than, than, than Grace for sure, but Grace had some beautiful, beautiful stuff. A, 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 a guest sat next to, to Calvin Coolidge at a, at a dinner and said, um, I'll bet you five bucks or something that I can get you to say more than three words in the next five minutes or something like that, that's 30 cents. The only thing he said during the whole dinner tour was, you lose. He was not a friendly man. <laughs> he just, that's just the bottom line. He was not, I mean, I'm, he liked to fly fish. Okay, um, I'm sure he was a, a, a nice enough guy. Um, he loved his kids, you know, he did, did, did some, some great stuff. He got elected president. But Grace Coolidge was the shining star in that administration. Similar to Dolly Madison. I've seen Dolly Madison. Whew, we need a whole nother day. But the Dolly Madison story, as I discovered it through going to multiple locations, you think you know Dolly, and then you go to Philadelphia and learn about Dolly Todd. Because James Madison was not Dolly's first husband. I've been to Dolly's birthplace in Greenville, Greensboro, North Carolina. She started out there. Father couldn't make it as a planter grower. Joined the Quakers, went to Philadelphia, didn't make it there. Dolly ended up working in her mother's uh, guest house. Point being, when she marries her first husband, she is a modest, humble, Quaker housewife that is educating her kids and younger siblings. When her first husband dies of yellow fever, and then she meets Madison, I'm taking out a lot of details here, clearly, but she walks out the front door of that house in Philadelphia, one of the most glamorous and remembered and celebrated first ladies of all time who's never been out of the continental United States, ever. She then helps her husband transcribe the notes of the Congressional Congress to pay for her retirement and ye later years in life. She turns into one of the greatest hostesses in White House history. I've seen her snuff box. How about that? So little Quaker bonnet apron Dolly Madison turns into whiskey punch, have a sniff of this, let's all party and get some things done here in Washington. Uh, that's a transformation. And I tell you, if I was at the Octagon House after the fire of the White House in the War of 1812, I'd want to be at one of Dolly's parties. Not one of James Madison's parties. So those two women stand out as much more well-perceived, more social, and that's a good thing. 
Like Martha Washington allowed her husband the financial freedom to do what he did, Grace Coolidge and Dolly Madison allowed their husbands to do the politicking that they needed to do while everyone was put in a more comfortable state, whether by whiskey punch or not, uh, to, to get things done. So there's my answer on that, I think. Right? I think I'm answering these questions, aren't I? Ben? Any other questions? We can also we can continue the conversation in the gift shop. Uh, if you have books with you, I can sign those. We want to talk more about any and all other things. I'm, 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 I'm yours for the day, Abilene. Thank you very, very much.